become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Good afternoon and welcome to today's Commonwealth event done virtually, uh, a conversation with Yulia Mendel. I'm Stephen Pfeiffer. I'm a retired Foreign Service officer, but I had the honor and privilege of representing the United States in Ukraine as the third American ambassador there at the end of the 1990s. I'm now an affiliate with the Center for International, International Security and Cooperation at Stanford, and I'll be conducting the conversation and then moderating questions. Uh, but first of all, uh, let me uh, thank on behalf of the Commonwealth Club, the Bernard Osher Foundation for making this event possible. It's my pleasure to introduce Yulia Mendel. She's author of The Fight of Our Lives, My Time with Zelensky, Ukraine's Battle for Democracy and What It Means for the World. And I had a chance to read the book uh, just this week in preparation for the session. Uh, very interesting read. Uh, Yulia, a longtime journalist, widely published. But for purposes of our event today, uh, she was uh, President Zelensky's first press secretary and spokesperson from 2019 until 2021. And during that time, she had a front row seat through a number of key events for Ukraine, and she had really the firsthand opportunity to view President Zelensky's leadership of Ukraine. She's also since then, of course, witnessed Russia's brutal invasion, an unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. And she can offer some thoughts about that ongoing war and what it means both for Ukraine, but also for the rest of the world. But before I get started, we're going to structure this all conduct a question, uh, discussion, a conversation with Yulia for 35 minutes or so, but then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. So please use your chat function on YouTube to submit the questions, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. So Yulia, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, let me start off with a question. In your book on page nine, you refer to President Zelensky as, quote, this neophyte politician. And indeed, I mean, he went from declaring candidacy on New Year's Eve in 2018 to less than five months later, he's the president-elect of Ukraine. So could you talk a bit about, I mean, here's somebody who's making a transition from being a comedian, an entertainer, a business person, all of a sudden to the president of a country of 45 million people. Could you talk about that transition uh, and you know, what strengths he brought and maybe what were some of the challenges for him? Well, Ambassador, thank you, first of all, for your introduction. And it's my honor to talk today and to accept your questions. I hope uh, I will share the word from, from Ukraine. Um, yes, I'm very happy that the book, The Fight of Our Lives, uh, was uh, out just this week when it's so crucial to have Ukraine in the middle of information space. And I really... Um, enjoyed, though it was quite an exhausting position, but I enjoyed to serve as press secretary of Volodymyr Zelensky for over two years. Um, let me say that uh, to my uh, mind, uh, he made this big transition from the businessman of entertainment business to statesman, and now from statesman to the world leader in war, uh, who, who can lead the country in war. Um, I won the competition, uh, and uh, when Zelensky came to power, uh, he was as, as popular as a rock star. It seemed that everyone wanted to work for him, uh, but uh, he decided to open uh, the competitions for big political positions. And uh, this was for the first time when the president of Ukraine opened a, a transparent competition for um, such a position as of his press secretary. I applied, I passed different stages only to learn later that there were around 4,000 of applicants. And this is probably the biggest competition in my life. And I'm telling the story on to show you that he came to uh, the position of the president trying to uh, establish there the rules of meritocracy, something that allowed actually him to become a successful uh, business person in Ukraine. Uh, the last interview that um, uh, I had with President Zelensky uh, was held in the form of press conference. So there were like his team and he were playing the role of media sharks. And I was... Uh, like already press secretary. And one of the questions was about uh, my motivation for this work. So I improvised and I thought, I said, if he as a business person from Ukraine, from quite 
quite a poor background from some province can become in a democratic way a president of this country. And me, uh, a person from also poor background from different province in a transparent way can become his press secretary. We can build actually a Ukrainian dream when anyone can achieve anything. And I think this was uh, something that he wanted to hear to understand that we were sharing the same vision of the country. So he came from the entertainment business, but he came with serious intentions. And I know that everybody knows that um, he is a comedian. He is known as, as a comedian, but at the same time, nobody talks that he's a lawyer by education and that he actually did something really impressive. He built a huge, large business in post-Soviet Ukraine when he was even invited to work in Moscow. And I, I know uh, like those people who agreed to Moscow's offer to become their producers on the biggest show. And they're like super successful and super rich uh, people. But when he got that order, uh, offer, he decided to decline. He made his personal decision to come back to Ukraine and together with his team to build something in very fragile, economy and that was i guess his personal way to say i don't want to depend on moscow and moscow interfered a lot in his affairs and it was clear from his uh, creativity from his uh, um, performance how he was going further and further from moscow and actually of course after russia invaded ukraine for the first time back in 2014 it was impossible to have any kind of sympathy or any kind of relations with moscow um if you ask me how he turned into the leader of the war um i was there for 25 months and i know that um, he prioritized achieving peace in Donbass, which unfortunately, you know, didn't happen because of Putin's large-scale invasion. But because of this priority, he was traveling to Donbass, to the military uh, action zone, for uh, nearly every month. And I saw so many situations that I describe in the book, actually, when uh, uh, he was going to the front lines to handshake with the soldiers, or even when the shelling was started, and his security service uh, did not allow him to go to the front line. He still was fighting with personal security and going to the soldiers, explaining this, that he was the leader and he needed to stay under the threat with his soldiers not to hide, not to run away. Uh, within this, seeing so many such situations, I actually knew that he was not going to leave Ukraine when there was the threat to his personal life and to the life of his family and when Russians were approaching to Kyiv. That's why I was not surprised that he left Ukraine. And despite of some criticism... That, that, he, stayed, that, that he stayed in Ukraine. <laughs> Yes, and he stayed in Ukraine, yeah. of course, in Kyiv. And despite of some criticism of his behavior before the war, in fact, after the war, he managed to do an impressive job. He showed the country that the leader was with them, that the country needed to stay united. He handshaked with the opposition, and he united the whole world to stand against this invasion, not only of Ukraine, but mm -hmm. of democracy, actually. Yeah. I hope I answered. Oh, yeah, that's good, yeah. I, and I will come to Let me ask a couple of questions, though, about uh, before the war, the uh, points you raise in your book, and one which I think mm -hmm. would be a particular interest to an American audience, but on page 109, you talk about this famous or rather infamous phone call between President Trump and President Zelensky. I'll be candid. I mm -hmm. read the memorandum of conversation. I, it seems to me that President Trump was trying to extort President Zelensky and, and basically had withheld American military assistance trying to elicit some kind of investigation into uh, uh, Hunter Biden. Uh, can you talk about, you know, the reactions, first of all, when that phone call came through, and then later on as this drama played out, and when you're watching, you know, this, you know the reports in America, which ultimately led, of course, to uh, Mr. Trump's uh, first impeachment. <laughs> Um, yeah. So first of all, let me uh, uh, say, like, disappoint you that I was not present at this famous call okay. because of some intrigues that you can find in the book. But at the same time, I saw the reactions after I was traveling to New York and was present at negotiations with Donald Trump. And I was taking all the media inquiries after. Um, so the thing is that 
when we today see how successful Ukraine can uh, fight Russia uh, on our territory, like and defend our territory from Russia, uh, we must understand uh, that back in 2013, when uh, Ukraine had the biggest actually revolution, um, Ukrainian army and Ukraine was under uh, the most corrupt and pro-Russian president. And that's why Ukrainian army was super weak at that moment. It was actually the soldiers were just painting walls instead of really training and becoming a strong institution. And that's why at that moment, it was very difficult to stand for, for uh, you know, against the Russian army, one of the biggest in the world. So since then, the United States became one of the most reliable partners and the United States was providing this assistance uh, that was going straight to Ukrainian army. It was the training with, you know, learning weaponry with, uh, you know, assisting in different uh, means so that actually we had a strong army. And within this, imagine if that, um, if that help, if that aid would be suspended, like, or would be stopped. So it would, the first thing uh, influenced the army. And that meant that that would benefit the only one person. And that would be Vladimir Putin. Because then, who knows, maybe he would like to invade earlier. Or maybe, you know, our army wouldn't be able to stand against Russian invasion and we wouldn't be independent country right now. So that was actually the threat to the trust between two of the most trusted partners in the world, like in the world, in, in Ukraine's relations, in Ukraine's independent history. But at the same time, uh, it was for the President Zelensky, I remember it was pretty annoying, especially when we arrived to New York and we were informed that the White House was going to release this conversation. It was not like somebody discussed it into deep details, like uh, I was informed in an hour or two that, you know, it it's going to be out. Um, so, um, yeah, for us, it was not about any quid for pro quo. For us, it was about the ability to defend our country and actually to trust in the partner who stood for us to help us to fight for our democratic uh, way of life. Yeah. But in the end, it seems like, though, you found a way, though, not to get pulled into American politics in a way that could have been fairly damaging for Ukraine. I think that that diplomat, uh, diplomat, diplomatic way that President Zelensky selected at that moment was the most correct because uh, definitely it was important for us to maintain relations with both parties, Democrats and Republicans. And yes, he decided to give America the chance just to have this internal debate by yourself. And he said, this is for you to decide, you know, what you want from your president, who is in charge and how the things are going. And that's the correct thing. We don't need to meddle in the politics of any country in the world. Okay. Uh, let me go uh, on page 94. Uh, you, and you were present at the Normandy uh, meeting in Paris, uh, hosted by uh, President Macron. This was the effort by President Macron and uh, German, then German Chancellor Merkel to try to broker some progress between Presidents Putin and President Zelensky. Uh, I think it was their first meeting, in, uh, actually their only meeting really in that format for six, six years now. But I, I found it interesting on page 94 when you saw Putin the term you described when you saw them was old age. Can you elaborate on that? <laughs> yes. Yes, that was one, this full meeting with four leaders in charge. So let me explain to the audience what is Normandy format. Like when Russia invaded Ukraine for the first time back in 2014, it invaded the part of Donbass. And so that leaders of that time uh, from uh, France, Germany, Ukraine, and Belarus decided to establish the Normandy 4 format where they were discussing how actually to achieve peace. And that was the straight dialogue between four countries, which was very important because, you know, it was maintained well. And... Uh, before Zelensky renewed this format, it had, it had been suspended for three years. So he managed to renew it. And there was really one meeting with four leaders. And the second meeting of this format was, avoided, uh, was ignored by Putin. It was in April 2021. But the first meeting, it was the only uh, in meeting in person between Zelensky and Putin. And 
it brought a lot of analysis. It gave a food uh, for our brains. Because uh, first of all, what I wanted to say that everybody considers that Putin is um, such a strong person for the reason that his propaganda was sharing this for over 20 years, that he's a dictator, you know, he must be a good negotiator. But it happened that no, it's, it's wrong for the reason that for 23 years, he never negotiated anything. What he was doing, just ordering, and he didn't expect any kind of contradiction, opposition, or criticism. So he really was a weak negotiator. He really felt bad when Zelensky, as a novice, uh, very well prepared, was um, uh, uh, chose the tactics of uh, repeating diplomatically his position again and again and again until he was getting the, the response that he wanted. Um, so uh, Putin was always asking his advisors about the information. He was uh, uh, putting his eyes down. He didn't feel comfortable sitting on the chair. But seeing him and his delegation, I really was thinking about the old age. And it's not about age. It's about being outdated. It's like about having outdated mindset, worldview, out, having outdated thoughts, reactions, wording. Everything was so outdated that I thought, you know, it cannot be the future. It can be only the past. Yeah, no, I, I, I would agree with that. I mean, to, to the extent that it looks like one of the driving forces behind what Putin is doing to Ukraine is this desire for a sphere of influence, a buffer zone. I mean, it really seems very much 19th century, uh, particularly <laughs> for a country like Russia, which has the world's largest nuclear arsenal. It's, it's quite, quite hard to understand. Uh, yeah, just, it's like Benjamin Button, but uh, in, in the terms of the state. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, they always say open up your book or written thing with something that grabs attention. And the first sentence of your preface was, I woke up to the sounds of explosions and air ride sirens, which grabs your attention. Uh, let me ask this question, because I, I traveled to Kiev uh, June, I'm sorry, January 30 to 31, so about three weeks before the Russian attack. And at that time, the U.S. government was saying publicly uh, they expected mm -hmm. major assault. Uh, I had been persuaded by conversations, but also watching just the scale of the Russian buildup and what was coming out of Moscow in terms of rhetoric that there would be a major attack. But I was surprised in Kiev in the conversations we had at the end of January, both with government officials and people outside, is people didn't think it. I mean, they thought it was a bluff or that if there was an attack. It might be a, a smaller military operation, perhaps in Donbass. <laughs> So let me ask, what, how did you see expectations at the end of January? Was this expected? Uh, or did you see it? Did, did, were we just talking to the wrong people when we were in Kiev? <laughs> what was your expectation at the end of January? You know, mm -hmm. did you see this mm -hmm. war coming? This is a very large scale question, to be frank. For the reason that I wouldn't say uh, uh, that uh, people expected or not expected. It was uh, different because it depended on, on if people believed. So right now, after seven months of war in Kyiv, I'm talking to people here and there, and many of them say, we still do not believe. And it's ridiculous because we all had this experience, right? And we, we know what's going on. We see it. We, you know, go through this every day. And we still cannot believe just, you know, with our hearts, probably with our minds, we understand what's going on. But the hearts, they just deny it for the reason that everything that we see is actually the Hollywood horror movie with all the, you know, horrors of the past of the 20th century of the World War II of genocidal practices of uh, artificial famine of holocaust and like we were like repeating for 80 years never again but now it's again right and yeah we just like like all our human being of ukrainians who are a peaceful country who never like attacked uh, anyone we cannot imagine that the war that somebody can come to our country on the tanks and do such things to to human beings that's so uh, still unbelievable in our minds and uh, i guess uh, we all know that president also uh, did not tell the people so the authorities were silent about that and uh, uh, th at that moment, I had even uh, some, um, uh, I had an appearance on television and I was asked if I, if I prepared an emergency luggage. And I said that I did. 
And the next morning I was attacked by many bloggers online who were laughing at me that I prepared an emergency uh, kit. Um, but I guess, you know, uh, the fate put everything uh, on the right uh, places. Yeah, no, I can understand that. I mean, as much as I anal analytically concluded that the Russians were likely going to attack, you know, at I think it was 10 p.m. on that Wednesday night here, when I saw the first reports, it was still something of a shock that the Russians had actually mm -hmm. uh, gone forward with it. But well, Ambassador, I, uh, am I we correct that uh, are we correct to say that there is no any logical reason for this attack, and there is no any mass after this attack? There is no any economy or anything that could be achieved. You see, if there is no any logics, then people cannot believe that it's happening. Yeah. But we all must be united organism that fights a huge disease. Because this is the battle, this is the fight for our very, very existence. Uh, I agree with that, and I think it's actually more than that. It's uh, you know, the West and Europe have a very important interest in Ukraine prevailing in this battle and defeating Russia, uh, and that if Ukraine loses, that's going to be uh, very, very problematic then for the West. Uh, let me uh, one question from the audience that came in, which I think follows on this point. Uh, if you could just talk really, and this might be less analytical, just your emotions, your feelings. I mean, you know, the first few days of the war, you know, you know, Russian missiles are striking Kiev. The Russian mm -hmm. army is launched from Belarus. It's launched from various different directions. Yeah. You know, what were your feelings, your reactions? What were you trying to do then? Um, so we tried to stay in Kiev as much as possible, but I had uh, information that they were going to Kiev. I had a actually all the information that I got from a friend and still I couldn't believe that but what I was watching everywhere it was like every moment repeating what, what was planned so I was watching Russian propaganda I was watching Ukrainian TV I was watching CNN and I clearly understood that Russians were moving so we were staying to, in Kiev to the very end we moved in an hour before the end of the city and the only uh, reason why we moved out was that I was afraid if we were encircled, that I, as a public figure, could be just captured and tortured. And I did not see any reason for this. If we talk about emotions, I know that Russians hate Ukrainian symbols very much. And I know if they find a person with Ukrainian tattoo, they take it with the skin. And they have been doing this in Donbass. And I know they're doing this now. This is like some, you know, fear that lives in my mind. And I was thinking many times was imagining at these two days how they're taking skin from me because I have a very big tattoo of Ukrainian symbols. And um, I that was a terrible time absolutely terrible i think that stress was going uh, in the under the skin uh, on the whole skin uh there was a cry there was you know necessity to 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 be serious and logical to i was glued to the telephones i was calling everyone my family was under occupation at that moment. I was trying to learn information. I was tweeting. There was a lot of Russian propaganda. There were a lot of fakes. So we went out on the 25th of February, but we decided principally never to leave the country. So we stayed for a few months in Lviv, doing like everything that's possible to do. But we were back to Kiev. And my husband, now husband, he went to the front lines for some time and he's been there. And he was very romantic at the moment uh, like but also i really think that that was a huge one of the hugest experience of our life because he went there to fight to my hometown to herson mm -hmm. he was like trying to be mild saying gentle saying i want to rejoin your hometown for like as a wedding gift mm -hmm. um it's not there yet but we didn't have a wedding <laughs> yeah. But we'll keep our fingers crossed that Tersone soon is back in uh, Ukrainian uh, possession. Um, you talked We're a praying little for about, this. Yes. You talked a little bit already about President Zelensky as a wartime leader. And I, I'd like to kind of push you a bit on that. I mean, I can remember back in January having conversations because the skill set you need to be a wartime leader is, is, is different from what you need in peacetime. And I can remember conversations with other American actors saying, if the Russians do invade, how will President Zelensky respond? You know, does, does he have 
the ability, the skill set to respond. I, I think, as you pointed out in your book, on the second or third day, there was a very clear indication when I think both the United States and the British military offered to evacuate him from Kiev. And he said, I don't need a ride out of Kiev. I need ammunition. Uh, and in the just following on that, I mean, he has emerged as the leader that, you know, Ukraine needed. I mean, he's kind of I, people make comparisons to Churchill and, and Germany. I'm sorry, in Britain in World War Two. Um, did you expect this? I mean, as, as you were thinking about this, uh, mm -hmm. you know, did, did, did you sort of see already the kind of skills that we've seen in the past you know, six months? Well, I already explained a little bit this at the very beginning, but I would like you uh, to visualize one picture. This is one, this one was one of the scariest uh, travels for me personally to Donbass. So when uh, Russia occupied part of Donbass, um, there was uh, in one of the towns, which is called Stanitsa mm -hmm. Um, there used to be a bridge which was destroyed and it had been destroyed for years. But around 10,000 people were crossing still that um, place every yeah. day so uh, yeah, to go good, from... Yeah. Yeah, from, from occupied territory to Ukrainian territory. It was very difficult to cross without the bridge, especially right. for elderly. So Zelensky decided to renew those, that bridge. And it was really renewed very fast. And once he brought the, an international leader, a guest, to Donbass, and he took this person to the bridge to show the bridge, he was very proud because he wanted to show that this was the symbol of connection. He wanted to put Ukrainians, you know, from that territory and this territory together. And uh, when we came there, the security stopped us for the reason that on the other uh, part side of the bridge on occupied territory. There were people with rifles and guns and uh, uh, there were uh, Russian journalists with, with cameras. It was very um, dangerous to go, enormously dangerous because what if they just wanted to make a provocation to film it on a camera, you know, and to break with their terrorist action. He was fighting with the security for like 30 minutes and the security didn't allow to go anyone of the delegation except the leaders and few other, uh, you know, security. But it was very important for him to come to the bridge and to show it, this to, to, to another leader for the reason that he wanted that Russia does not see any kind of fear, that he showed to Russia that he belonged to this land. He was the leader of this land and that he was not afraid to move in his land. That was his bridge, that was his territory, that was his home home country. So I think this was one of many, many situations when I understood that he needed, he wanted to be with the people. Um, he wanted to be leading and uh, that actually um, he was going, you know, to stay in the most, stay in the most critical positions. And one of the biggest, uh, one of the phrases that he often repeated was that politics needs to serve people and we must not uh, uh, forget about this. Um, that's why, again, I was not surprised that he stayed, but I'm really proud that he stayed in the country because like eight months earlier, we have the experience of Afghanistan and unfortunately the situation was um, much more sorrowful. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, let me remind the audience, uh, if you have questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. Let me let me take one from the audience right now, Yulia. And it said, you know, you discuss um, in almost the 30 years of Ukraine's independence, Ukrainian political parties really did not come up with either a unified state ideology or their own ideological values. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about why you think that happened? And then let me add on to that. Is the war, will the last seven months of what Ukraine has gone through change that? You won't be surprised if I say that uh, the division in the Ukrainian society was in many ways caused by Russia. Um, so what Russia does actually, it tried to penetrate uh, every sphere of Ukraine's life and it tried to influence people's minds and hearts with its propaganda. But also it was influencing previous Ukrainian elections, trying to divide the society uh, based on our emotions and fears. And I'm sure that Americans understand this a little bit later now with the appearance of social media and internet, right? But uh, there are a lot of these uh, now 
bot bot farms and trolls all these you know messages from internet that try to play with your fears you know and try to influence your political decisions and i now working in uh, ukrainian politics uh, for years i know that this uh, started uh, happening in ukraine since early 2000s when ukrainians were tried to be divided and many of those people who actually were developing this awful uh, political strategies they were either pro-Russian or actually of Russian origin, working for, you know, different Ukrainian candidates, including the candidate Yanukovych, Viktor Yanukovych, who fled later the country. Um, and this was like such a tendency that already it became so okay for Ukrainian politicians try to divide the electorate to fight for one of the parts, that when Zelensky came, he actually provided a lot of hope to the people because everything that he was working on in his ideology was to establish the unification of the people. He was criticized in many ways by opposition, but also he was criticized by Russian and pro-Russian media a lot. But he always was standing for for this value of unification as actually one of the values of, of actually human beings because he strongly believed that united we we are stronger and i think that um again ukrainians probably you know ukrainians are the most democratic and the most uh, uh free country in post-soviet region and that's why we allowed ourselves to have a lot of hot debates and discussions in the society but when it came to this huge external uh threat we are as united as possible because again we feel like one organism who needs to stand against the death virus and I strongly believe that we will stand against it. And after that, do you think that, in fact, there will be this sort of emergence of a common ideology among Ukrainian political parties? I mean, certainly political parties <laughs> will have differences, but sort of a certain set of core beliefs, core values that are shared across the political spectrum. Does First of all... Uh, first of all, let me say my point of view, and you may disagree, but I think if there is democracy, there always will be debates and discussions. We see that in Russia, there are no any debates and discussions, and it's always one candidate, right? So there is nothing bad in this. But what I see also, and it's a new tendency, so if Ukrainian politics used to be divided and Ukrainian society among probably two biggest narratives, one is for the West and another is for Russia, and those for Russia was declared lining with years more and more getting like a very very small percent somewhere you know now uh, even though even those people who could have some kind of nostalgia to the soviet union they totally lost it like i know this because i am from the region that uh, uh, is a russian speaking region and there could be some you know soviet nostalgia because it was very close to uh, russia but at the same time let me say that when russians came to my hometown People said uh, that they never believed that those who used to fight fascists turned into fascists themselves. Mm -hmm. And the second thought, which was very important for me, you know, they lived everyday life. And of course, they noticed some bad road or some bad equipped uh, hospital, etc. But when Russians came and started stealing toilets and washing machines, people said, we never knew how much we achieved. Now we know. And people are going to fight for this. And this means a lot because this is what market uh, uh, economy and democratic ideology provides uh, to the societies. So now I think Ukrainian, after the war, Ukrainian politics will have different directions. There will no be pro-Western and pro-Russian because there is nothing pro-Russian in Ukraine anymore. It's all pro-Western. Uh, there will be another division. Uh, there are politicians who definitely want to tell Ukrainians that, you know, let's be all about Ukraine, only Ukrainian language, Ukrainian culture, Ukrainian products. Let's stick to something very national. And there will be different who will say, let's be a global country. Let's have as many languages as possible. Let's deoccupy Russian, uh, de de I'm sorry, demonopolize Russian language. Let's become global citizens. Uh, what I see from what I see, this is going to be two biggest standards in Ukraine politics after the war. Okay. Uh, let me ask a related question here, which came in from one of the audience members saying um, that uh, you talk, in fact, you had a, a, an entire chapter talking about this issue of language. 
And, and oh, the yeah. trauma of language, the historic attempts made by Moscow to basically yeah. eradicate the Ukrainian yeah. language. Yeah. Um, but can you talk a little bit more about the, both the power of the language and, and Russian versus Ukrainian uh, and how you know, it's viewed in Ukraine now? Well, you know, the language issue was uh, in many ways uh, uh, the issue of identity for Ukrainians. And uh, that's why it, it, it was and it is one of the most traumatic uh, uh, discussions and issues and questions for Ukrainians. Um, and you are correct that Russia, uh, as part of Russian empire and the Soviet Union, tried to eradicate uh, Ukrainian language. Uh, it has been banned uh, in history for at least 40 times. It's uh, impossible to imagine that as a Ukrainian, somebody is not allowed to talk Ukrainian at schools, to uh, learn in Ukrainian to speak just in open society. Even Ukrainian literature was pressed that it's like with, with, with banning Ukrainian language, Russia, Moscow was trying to say that we are just a sub-nation, you know. There were a lot of stereotypes that Russian propaganda through the years was amplifying on our nation, trying to show that we, as many other nations, just like sub-nation. And Russian la and nation and language was the biggest, the most normal, the most, uh, the strongest and, and you know, uh, the best. Uh, so I was brought up in the region that is Russian-speaking region, and I was the first to speak Ukrainian language. Uh, there was this division of the languages in the region, like in the villages, people um, didn't speak Ukrainian or Russian. That was some a combination of Ukrainian or Russian that was called surzik. So uh, they could use some words from Russian, but at the same time, the pronunciation and uh, the rules and many wording, they were uh, either Ukrainian or combination with Russian, which was very tasty and absolutely specific. Um, but at the same time, when uh, Ukraine became independent, a lot of Ukrainian schools opened in the region. And my parents, this, they gave it a thought if to send me to Russian-speaking school or to Ukrainian-speaking. But I'm very proud that I learned Ukrainian so well that actually I defended my PhD. I had a lot of traumas being the only Ukrainian-speaking child in the school. Uh, I had problems with friends, but I always knew that I was correct for the reason that once a teacher asked us a question, uh, if in England they speak English and in France they speak French, why do in Ukraine we speak Russian? And I never found the answer to this question, very simple one, until I grew up and read a lot of about usage of languages. Um, my mother thought that being bilingual, I would be stronger. And I'm very happy to know uh, Russian while I am personally a Ukrainian speaker, um, but also I'm very proud to know English. Um, so you need to know that Ukrainian, the issue of Ukrainian Russian language is one of the most traumatizing for Ukrainians, but it is also the question of our identity and Russia trying to weaponize Russian language actually, and the word itself um, made a lot of Ukrainians to switch to Ukrainian because many of the influencers even, they said, we will, speak, we will be speaking Ukrainian after, after invasion because we don't want to have anything with terrorists. And for Ukrainians, Russia is a terrorist state. Yeah, yeah that, that was interesting. I mean, when I served in Kiev at the end of the 1990s, my guess is probably you know, 40, 45% of the population used Russian as their first language. Mm -hmm. And then you write in your book that today it's about 18% of the population use Russian as their first language. Let's say, yeah, that recognize Russian as their, uh, yeah, uh, right. whole, whole, like uh, language. Well, you, yeah. Yeah, and, and I've seen, yeah, you, you mentioned, I've seen lots of anecdotes of, of people in Ukraine saying after this war, you know, if they don't speak Ukrainian, they're going to learn Ukrainian. I saw this one of a soldier fighting and he said, first thing I'm doing after the war is learning Ukraine, I will never speak Russian again. Let's let, project forward 10, 10 years from now. What percentage of the population of Ukraine in 10 years is going to be using Russian as their first language? <laughs> That's a very difficult question. It's very ungrateful to be a, a fortune teller. <laughs> um, I think it will be a declining uh, for the reason that, again, we felt like uh, Russia turned Russian language into the language of war. 
unfortunately. Um, but again, you know, Russian language still, still exists. And I cannot say to which percent it will decline, but uh, many Ukrainians understand uh, Russian. And during the war, there was a very interesting thing that just happened by itself from the society. Um, Russia sent a lot of uh, groups to Ukraine, and a lot of them had arrived before the war. They were just planted in different regions. And when uh, uh, Russia started attacking all the Ukraine, uh, checkpoints appeared, and people took the rifles. And so all the cars were checked. And they were checked also. It was very easy to check if people knew Ukrainian. Because if you're Ukrainian anyway, you know it. Better or worse, but you know it. And Russians never know Ukrainian. So if people did not speak a word of Ukrainian, it was clear, you know, that uh, they were like not Ukrainians. And especially, specifically, there is Russian accent. Uh, so Russian Ukrainian is different uh, from 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 Russian Russian. So uh, that's how several groups of uh, 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 Russian uh, uh, like soldiers sent before the war were caught. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, well, just one kind of other follow-up question. Um, I had a conversation with uh, another Ukrainian journalist about three months ago. Mm-hmm. And he, he predicted that after this war, there would be a real effort in Ukraine to sort of push back against Russian culture. So, for example, he said, you know, there are mm-hmm. hundreds, if not thousands, of Ukrainian towns that have their Pushkin Square. He thought mm-hmm. after the war, they would all be renamed. Um, mm-hmm. Do you see that kind of cultural... I mean, I can understand... <laughs> the enmity that uh, has been generated uh, in Ukraine towards Russia by this war. Uh, do you think it would be that, that big of a pushback? Well, in 2014, when we made it to flee the country, uh, like pro-Russian, the most corrupt president, Yanukovych, uh, we had started decommunization because Ukraine definitely said no to communism and Soviet past. So right now, I think there will be derusification because, again, everything that comes from Russia causes so much pain to Ukrainians. As a Ukrainian, my heart is bleeding. And from time to time, I just cannot control me going into tears because every day I'm passing through the awful experiences in my life. And I cannot understand how in civilized 21st century we can actually allow this to happen. All those tortures, all those kids, all those, um, you know, rapes, all those deaths. Uh, I, 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 you know, it's like, and all this is caused by Russia. So um, many of the poets, uh, poets who, who's got monuments in, in Ukraine, Pushkin, as you mentioned, you know, they really uh, did not ever, you know, um, think about independence or about a Ukrainian as an identity. They always were thinking about us as sub-nation and developing their Russian culture on this basis as a fundamental one, you know, Russia, big boss, some others like secondary class. So um, I guess this is the choice of Ukrainian society. And if it causes a lot of pains, uh, we need to go to move forward to this, you know, and, and to allow people to get rid of the things that cause so much pain. Okay. Um, a question, uh, that I have, you, you talked a, a bit about the beginning of the war and the earnest negotiating efforts made by President Zelensky and the Ukrainian team. So, for example, I think it, it was publicly known that, that he had agreed, we will set aside NATO ambitions, we will accept neutrality, although, albeit with some conditions. There mm-hmm. were some things I, that I interpret as perhaps even perhaps readiness to talk a bit about territory. Um, mm-hmm. But it's also pretty clear, and I think it's understandable, that the Ukrainian part of two attitude on negotiations has become uh, harder and more resolved. Yeah. Then, yeah. Can, can yeah. you talk? Or, you know, why do you think that's happened? What's what's happened there? Uh, yeah, you're right. Perhaps in my book, uh, I'm uh, uh, still mentioning the negotiations that uh, had been held in March. Um, yeah. They finished. They finished in in uh, um, offers by Ukrainian side of how we could move towards peace, and they were declined. First, we heard uh, Putin's press secretary Peskov declining them, but just uh, last week there was the story from Reuters where uh, they had three sources saying that Putin declined those offers, uh, which shows that Putin actually was not uh, serious about sending those group of those men, you know, who actually did not have, in fact, any uh, real responsibilities, uh, mm. you know, to lead the conversation. 
right now, of course, but, but then was Bucha. What are you talking about? It was before Bucha. Then there was Bucha. And seeing, you know, this terrifying things, I don't know that Ukraine, I don't, I'm not sure that Ukrainians will be able to forget or forgive uh, what has been done to us. And this is not even, you know, this is just the beginning of uh, something that we can reveal um, when we deoccupy the other territories, because right now we have 1.2 million of Ukrainians that stay still in occupation. Uh, so, of course, um, the, after that, everything has been changed and we understand that we want to retake all our territories back and we understand that we want to align with the standards at, as uh, uh, with the NATO standards as much as, as it's needed and uh, of course we um, the president said already that uh, it's not negotiable that Crimea is of course Ukrainian side so before that we wanted to have like around 15 years to continue these discussions of you know how to return Crimea right now we want it uh, uh, back as fast as possible uh, but I guess I guess of course the major the major thing in all this war is that we need to show to Russia that we are strong enough because Russia is not going uh, uh, to leave us to um, negotiate if they don't understand that we are strong they're just gonna grab and kill and the second thing uh, when they understand that we are strong and we can retake some part of the territory we will see where we will be and today President Zelensky said Maybe we will need to um, negotiate, you know, to return Crimea with diplomatic means, which, uh, which, which means, you know, that they are considering the best way how we take the territories, but they are not giving up the idea of restoring Ukraine in the internationally, internationally recognized borders. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that's an interesting point. And I, I think um, I had the same understanding. Watching from 5,000 miles away, that's been my perception, is that the revelation about Russian atrocities, war crimes, and, and not just in Bucha, but really in multiple places, really seems to have hardened the resolve, both in the government, but also in the public. Um, would you say that, I mean, another factor that seems to me is, though, maybe growing confidence in the Ukrainian military, and I say it as one who uh, you know, was saying back in January, you know, if the Russians invade, the Ukrainians will resist. But I have to be frank, uh, like the U.S. government, like most NATO members, I did not expect the Ukrainian military to put up the kind of fight that we've seen. Uh, I expected that the Russian military would make significant progress, but then the resolve would be shown and that there would be you know, a guerrilla movement, an insurrection. It, it would just be you know, across the country, an occupied territory, would be very, very hard for the Russians to maintain. Uh, but we have seen the Ukrainian military put up a you know, astounding fight, uh, both in terms of starting with the defense of Kyiv, but also you know, defending Donbass, uh, and then the counteroffensive that we've seen in Kharkiv. Did you expect that? I mean, back, 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 back on February 25, you know, did, did, did you think that, I mean, I don't think there's anybody doubting that the Ukrainian military, that Ukrainians had the resolve, the will to fight. But did, did you expect that they would be as effective as we've seen? I think it certainly comes as a surprise to uh, the Kremlin and the Russian general staff. Ambassador, um, I didn't have a choice, you know, this, uh, I didn't have the right to expect or not to expect at that moment. Okay. I just needed to believe and that's what i was doing with all my heart because uh, for me as for millions of ukrainians my country is the value it's something that we have building with a lot of challenges with a lot of personal fights with you know military fights it's the country that provided us our first dreams and plans and that provides us all opportunities and we want to build it because we believe in it and that's why i believe that ukrainians are not the people who are gonna give up um uh, let me tell you that like i didn't take the rifle by myself you know i wouldn't go uh, uh 
I, I believe that if I appear at the battlefield, unfortunately, I will be just uh, killed <laughs> immediately. Uh, but at the same time, I was trying to contribute differently. And I, I said to myself, I'm not leaving. I've got a lot of offers from, you know, different countries and I've got even job offers. And I said, no, I'm staying. I didn't have jobs. I, I didn't have anything. I just said, I, I'm, I'm here because we belong to this land and uh, we wanted to thrive and we wanted to achieve the biggest, you know, results. We, we see how how far you know we we can move and how fast we can move again i'm very proud that my country is the biggest territory of freedom and the biggest democracy in post-soviet region and i don't think that during all the putin's wars because putin has started many there had ever been any country or any army that would actually defeat you know him uh with having bragging was like being like the second largest army in the world we have high morale despite of the fact that we are tired we have huge motivation russians have corruption as a part of their identity that's why they came absolutely not prepared no uniform normal no fuel no food you know and they don't have any motivation just to die there over 54000 of russian servicemen have been eliminated which means even if propaganda in russia is huge there are 54000 of families for whom this is a personal tragedy already. And we believe that we this stand, we're not only saving Ukraine, we're actually helping to bring new fresh air in Russia and to bring first cracks into this autocracy of Putin that he has developed through the years. Okay, well, that's a, a question coming out that says you're now beginning to see well, reports over the last 10 days how Russian forces were really routed. I think the uh, Russian Ministry of Defense called it a regrouping. Um, I think most military experts would look at it and say that didn't look like an organized regrouping. It looked like people were really uh, <laughs> fleeing for their lives. And you've also seen an increasing number of Russian soldiers surrendering. Um, how do you see the morale on, uh, a little bit more on the on the Russian side now? I mean, is, is this an army that's basically? you know, may just collapse because of the lack of motivation. How, how is that seen in Ukraine? Is that, is that? You know, I would say like right now I came up with the idea that looking at this army, we can say that this is the army of mercenaries, the army of criminals and the army of losers. Uh, for the reason, for the reason that, um, yeah, there are mercenaries there and they definitely know how to make this job, but they are people who are like killing for money. Uh, there are criminals because we've seen that they are hiring criminals whom they are taken from jail, promising them that if they go to the war, they will not be back to jail, but then they need to survive. And we see the losers. And why I'm saying that, because these are people who thought or who just had army as their only way to develop their career. And they went there thinking that they will, you know, grow professionally, maybe at trainings as they were light, you know, or just come back in a year or two. And then they were made to kill people, you know, and they came in the tank in, in tanks to, to the regions where people were going out without weapons against these tanks and saying, we're not Nazi in Russian and saying, you are not welcome, turn your tanks away and go away. And that was happening in so many regions and how much bravery should these people have in themselves to go against tanks? I still cannot believe there were these protests in the Russian speaking regions with, with the Ukrainian flags and Russians just started shooting these people. You know. Russians, they cannot defeat the freedom uh, trying to glorify the state of slavery. It's not possible to do. Ukrainians are not slaveries by, by the default. And we freedom is our fundamental value. That's what is, we are taught since our first steps. And that's why we are going to stand against Russia to the very end. This is our land. This is our home. This is our families. We deserve 
justice. Justice is to let us allow as we want on our uh, land. Um, and about regrouping, there was a funny case. There was a guy sent to Kharkiv and by his profession, he is a military sailor. And Kharkiv doesn't have any ports or any exit to uh, any uh, seaside. <laughs> and so he was there in the tent. He was caught and now he's in prison. And he was saying to the camera that he didn't know what to do. He was just put into tank and it was called regrouping. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's any kind of regrouping. It doesn't make any military sense. I think that just military leadership cannot bring these people back because then Putin will recognize that he is defeated and, of course, he will be angry at this military leadership. So they're just saving their... Yeah, I'm sorry for this word, but they uh, yeah. for, you know, keeping these people in Ukraine. Yeah. Well, how does this end? And when does it end? I mean, is there a negotiated settlement at some point possible? And, and how quickly till we uh, get to that point? You know, this is uh, a difficult question. Uh, and it's not definitely the question for me. And I don't think that there is any person in the world who would answer you how and when it will finish. Definitely, we tried to negotiate with, Nash uh, with Russia for eight years. And uh, this was as negotiation with a terrorist state. You know, whatever you negotiate and whatever you agree is always violated, manipulated. Then there is blackmail, lies, and again, attack. We've seen this in Donbass. By the way, in Donbass, though it was like much smaller level of uh, attack, there were 14,000 of people who died in Donbass and millions lost their homes. Right now, I cannot even imagine how many people died because of, of Russian horrible actions. So um, what I see and what I hear and talk, like what, what, what I, uh, uh, you know, uh, first of all, Ukrainian leadership is very flexible, which is very good. Because in war, you need to be prepared for everything and the flexibility provides the opportunity to move forward. Uh, I see that Ukrainian leadership is not ready for compromises anymore, which makes a lot of sense. But I see also that Ukrainian leadership wants to regain as much as possible territories that Russia took over after February 24. And then there will be winter. So we will need to see at what you know stage we will be because a uh, fight in winter is different than fight in other other seasons. I saw already that um, Ukrainian uh, uh, high uh, top officials predict that the war will continue in early 2023, but I definitely know that Ukrainian leadership wants to finish it as fast as possible. The only thing that we need to finish it on Ukrainian terms, and actually on the terms not only of Ukraine, but on the terms of, of the West, on the terms of justice, on the terms when Russia takes out the troops, gives us our lands, on the terms when Russia is held accountable, and this is very important. If Russia wants to have any future, Russia needs to be accountable. And uh, we will see where we'll be in 2023. I'm sure when Putin understands that he doesn't have any chances to win this war, and I guess he doesn't believe this to the very end, um, you know, we will uh, be glad to negotiate what, 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 what is left. Okay. Well, I, I think we have time for just one more question. So... Uh, let, let me take me, you back to your job that you had as, as press secretary. I mean, you know, could you talk a little bit about the challenges of the job? I mean, on the one hand, you're working for somebody who knows how to connect to his audience and may have his own views about it. Uh, but what were the challenges and, and sort of what were the most interesting parts of it? And then would you take the job if it was offered again? <laughs> I never thought about this question. Maybe I will avoid it. But um, yeah, imagine me being like a 32-year-old uh, female uh, sitting at the table with um, like really metric men who are in many ways richer, uh, more powerful, and who always, uh, who all were wanted to influence President Zelensky's decisions. Many of them thought that my voice was not really important. Um, so... Uh, it was difficult at the very beginning. Uh, the team that brought Volodymyr Zelensky to power was insisting that uh, we, as press service, um, did not need to collaborate with the media. It is really, it, it, it sounds absurd, but we were banned from answering media inquiries. We were banned uh, to organize interviews with the president or even to comment on the you know, simplest issues. And it was really a very difficult, hard time. And... Uh, 
it just took time and work that Volodymyr Zelensky saw that uh, he needed to be transparent with the media if he wanted to be a leader of a democratic state. And it all sounds very strange right now from the position when we see that Volodymyr Zelensky communicates so well with all the world. Uh, but I'm proud right now that I was there to the very beginning and I was there organizing interviews and shaping the messages, you know, and helping him understand the media uh, better. So when he's sitting today as really a great speaker, I'm happy that there was like my small contribution at the very beginning. Also, the second thing, to be frank, <clears throat> I met a lot of um, what is called misogyny, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pronouncing it correct, online. And I, I, I know that many American females also suffer from this, um, mostly from Russia. Russia developed the whole social media infrastructure of uh, bots, uh, lies, propaganda, you know, and they were attacking me for being not attractive enough uh, so that it was a shame for me to represent with my appearance the Ukrainian state and also for being non-professional. Uh, and the opposition was picking up some uh, messages, of course, and uh, some attacks, they were so enormously huge with the fakes going like through all uh, post-Soviet space. So to some uh, to some point, it was really very, very difficult, but I know that the United States also is struggling right now to have their disinformation battle. And I know that the White House was trying to make disinformation department. I don't know how they're moving with this, but this is the challenge for the future. And if we want to move with the future, we need to understand that information is also a weapon and we need to have a good instrument to fight it back. Yeah. Well, Yulia, thank you very much for a really interesting conversation. Uh, I think our time's up. Uh, we've been talking to Yulia Mandel. She's author of The Fight of Our Lives. Uh, it's now available. And I would encourage those who really want to get a deeper understanding of what's been going on in Ukraine in the last three years to, to get a copy. Uh, also, if you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club, um, either both in, in virtual presentations or in-person programming, uh, please visit commonwealthclub.org uh, and you'll find some places there as to how you can help. I'm Stephen Piper. Thank you very much for joining us. And I hope you all have a good afternoon. And Yulia, thanks again for being with us. Ambassador, thank you for this very professional moderation. It was very interesting to talk. Uh, and thank you to Commonwealth Club for having me. It's my really honor to talk to the audience uh, and uh, to, to be on this uh, platform. Thank you. Thank you.